Well, good morning. I think we're good on the microphone there. Is that right? Okay, okay good deal. Well, it's such a blessing to be out with you this morning. I'm really excited for a topic this morning. I appreciate Trenton leading those songs that he did, because I think that's going to prepare us very well for what I want to talk to you about today. And that's something I've already confessed to him I'm going to step on my own toes about. And that's evangelism. Talking to the people of this world, um, expressing the good news of the gospel to them. And when I was thinking about ways to talk about the good news of the gospel, what occurred to me, well, I was trying to think of good places to go to talk about that. Good places that'd be inspirational, one, but places that have been recorded through God's wisdom and His Spirit to relay messages to us about how we can talk to people today. And I think, I'm going to talk about it a little more in a minute, the way the world is oriented today, the way our community is being shaped, I think we can glean a lot of wisdom on how to season our words with salt from the message that Paul gives at Mars Hill there in Athens to the, these people that have described this altar to an unknown God. So we're thinking about Paul in Athens. Um, a brief background for Paul. Now, if you were here for our meeting um, on the transitions from Saul to Paul, you're going to be very well equipped. And as was proven, there's a whole meeting in there, so we won't be talking as much about that this morning. But I wanted to talk for a brief background for our visitors that are here and who weren't able to be at that meeting. So Paul was formerly Saul. Um, he was a a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as we'll get there in a second. But he's called by Jesus on the road to Damascus. Um, he then becomes from, comes from a persecutor to a preacher of the gospel. Um, and not maybe what human wisdom would think. He's a preacher of the gospel to the Gentiles, those who aren't of the Jewish nation. And he arrives in Athens. Um, this is his second missionary journey, if you're familiar with that. He's been to Thessalonica earlier in the chapter, um, and then driven to Berea, and then He continues on to Athens and we will meet back up with his party um, back in Corinth here in a little while. But he has this time in Athens. Um, It's kind of a way station, if you will. He's he's stuck here in the meantime. Um, But Paul, being the preacher that he was, doesn't let the meantime go to waste. Um, And we'll see in a second, his spirit is stirred within him. The composition of the, the group there, well, I guess the community there in the city of Athens... Um, let's go ahead and turn to Acts 17. That's going to be that's where my ribbon is in my Bible, if you want to put your ribbon there. We're going to spend the majority of our time there. We'll, we'll go all the way across the scriptures here, but this will be a good, a good home base for us. So to kind of set it up here, this is where we take, pick up there in, in verse 16. So he's been traveling with Silas and with Timothy. Um, but verse 16, and I'm really, all these verses will be from the New King James. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? And others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what it is of this new doctrine of which you speak? For you are bringing something strange to our ears. Therefore we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So I've delineated a couple groups here. Obviously there's a synagogue here, and throughout Paul's ministry he's going to go to the synagogue first to talk to those those folks there, they have Gentiles and Jews in the synagogue here. Um, it's probably proselytes if we're, if we're thinking about that there. The marketplace philosophers, I've listed them as the Epicureans and the Stoics. These are people who like to be around and who like to talk about, air quotes, religious things. Okay, They like to hear about things that sound religious. They like to talk through religious things. Um, in this culture, that debate was a big part of things, or you wanted to be associated with certain groups of philosophy. So there's a lot of debate about who you followed and who someone else would follow and who you ascribed meaning to as far as philosophers go. And then you had a lot of people here who just wanted to hear something new. Okay, um, Entertainment, like back then, was not as it is today. And if you wanted to know what was going on, you needed to go out to the marketplace or go out to Mars Hill and, and find out what was happening. So Paul has this opportunity to present what's new to these people. Okay, And new to them was sometimes the resurrection. 
And then we think about, well, it's kind of on the nose, right? Well, what's the composition of Athens like now? Well, in the work that I do, I go between Rogersville and Athens, and I just talk to a whole lot of people every day. And the composition here is changing, and it's becoming more diverse. Um, you know, we have our brethren here. Um, if you wanted to go to a gospel meeting every week in Limestone County, you probably could. And that's certainly a blessing, and we're blessed to have a lot of brethren in this area. But we also have a lot of people that would categorize themselves as religious, right? Or maybe semi-religious, people that would be, say, self-proclaimed churchgoers or semi-churchgoers. We also have people here who would assent to there being a God in heaven. You know, they would be spiritual people. They might um, buy something at Hobby Lobby that says that they're blessed, but not maybe not think about it more than that. Um, but we also have people that aren't religious here now, who are non-spiritual, whether actively atheistic or agnostic, where they just don't maybe think about the existence of God on a day-to-day -day basis, or wouldn't consider themselves searching for a religious type experience, or um, searching for the existence of God. But because we have this melting pot of different outlooks, Paul also talked to a melting pot of different outlooks. When I was talking about stepping on my toes, I'm thinking, well, how do I talk to all these people I encounter on a day-to-day -day basis and maybe find an opportunity to talk to them? Or maybe find an opportunity to make a relationship with people that I encounter that can be impactful for the Lord, to bring about talking about the good news with them. How do we do that? I think this is a great example. What Paul does here in the city of Athens is what we could do in the city of Athens or North Alabama or wherever you live if you're visiting here today. Um, I found this online. I was looking up, of course, the material for a sermon, and I came across a website. Um, David Padfield had a great outline of this sermon, and I'm going to borrow a lot from what he did there but especially these kind of the three-point sermon that Paul has here. The first two, and I think it's important to note, this is the majority, if we're doing the outline perspective, talk about God. And that's simple, right? If we're going to talk about the gospel and we talk about God, we're on good footing, okay? We're going to talk about how awesome God is in several different ways, and that's exactly what Paul relays to the people here. But then, too, he talks about the judgment um, and that may not something we think about bringing up to people right off, but Paul has 10 verses here, and he does talk about the judgment for a fair amount of them. And he kind of gets into talking about the judgment in a way that I don't know I would have thought of. And even if reading this passage a bunch of times, I don't know if I picked up on it until just making the sermon notes for this. So we'll talk about that, and then I want to talk about the applications, right? So what Paul did this then, what do we do today? So the first point he makes is talking about how God is all-powerful. Now I'm going to pick up, I want to talk about how he introduces the sermon as well, but we'll pick off exactly where we left off there at verse 22. I'm going to say Mars Hill because I really struggle to say Areopagus consistently, so y'all bear with me on this, okay? The King James Version does have it Mars Hill there, but they, they mean the same thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. <clears throat> so the God of heaven is all-powerful, and that's one thing we can come away from in reading these few verses. God made the world and everything in it. This is something, if you're a Christian here this morning, or even if you just generally know things about the God of heaven, that's something you know already, right? We can see that right in the beginning of our text, right there at the beginning of Genesis. But I do want to turn over to a passage in Isaiah just to flesh this out a bit more. So it's on your screen there, but Isaiah chapter 40, we'll be going to verse 21 there and reading that extended passage.
think often it's enlightening to hear how God talks about himself, especially if we're going to introduce other people to God. There's no better way than to hear how he describes himself. Verse 21, have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told from you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretch out over the heavens just like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he will also blow on them, and they will wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me? Or whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number? Who calls them all by name? By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints, neither is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So these are things we know about God. But the people we come in contact on a day-to-day basis, these people that Paul's talking to on Mars Hill, they may not have, okay? And we can't take that for granted. We're going to have to find opportunities, as Paul does, to talk to people about this. And maybe not even just the creative aspects of God, though he is preeminent in that, But his creation would have been very foreign to them, even if they understood mythical beings that maybe were around in Greek and Roman culture. The Greek lowercase gods, if we'll call them that. But what they understood to be spiritual beings were a lot of times very self-serving. And they took advantage of people. And they tried to trick people. God's the opposite. It says here in the text, and let's go back to Acts 17 to see how tall Paul talks about it. He says God made the world and everything in it. But he didn't make it because he needed a dwelling. God didn't need anything that he made. He didn't have to make the heavens and the earth to be God. He was God well before then. And he will be God after the heavens and the earth vanish away. And he's worshipped by men, but it's not because he needed that either. In fact, it's for our good that we worship God and assent to his existence. God is self-sufficient, but he's self-sufficient and he loves us. He's self-sufficient and he cares about us. And that's where his graciousness comes in. God didn't have to do any of these things, but he wanted it for us. God made all these things not because he needed any of them, but because he wanted to give life to us. He wanted us to experience his love. And that's how awesome our God is, is that he's completely self-sustaining. He's completely self-independent. There's nothing you can give to God that he needs, but yet he still desires a relationship with you. He wants you. He's all-powerful, but he also loves you. So that's what Paul talks about thus far. He also, you know, has made the boundaries of the earth. He's determined how the earth will run. He's determined its order, we've seen there in verse 26, and determined how time will function. Um, We can, you know, marvel at the majesty of his creation. But the second point is about how God is everywhere. That the God of heavens is near to each one of us. Let's read verse 27 and 28. So he's determined the boundaries of their dwellings there at the end of verse 26, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and we move and we have our being, as also some of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So Paul's talking here about how available God is to us. And the first thing, I think even those who have maybe an agnostic background or maybe are questioning whether God is, could concede that God is searchable, okay? And that's our first point, that God can be looked for. Um, The evidence is, um, I'm about to say the evidence is evident, but the, (laughs) the evidence is right out there, okay? We know that the heavens declare that there is a God. We know that creation declares that there is a creator, And we understand that. 
Um, and people see that, and people know it um, intellectually, whether we'll admit to it or not, but understand that in all likelihood, this is not a happy accident that we're here. The actual statistics of such a thing occurring, um, and then two, the eternity that God's put in our hearts make that difficult to deny. But these people may say, certainly someone could quest for God, but they may not embark on such a quest. But if someone were to look for God, he would be found. Let's turn to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. I think maybe a lot of people we come in contact think of the search for God as a vain quest, but in fact, that's not it at all. And that's what this passage talks about. Let's read verse 29 here. And it assures us of this. He's talking to the children of Israel here, but it applies to us as well today. But from there, you will seek the Lord your God. He's talking about the children of Israel in the promised land. And you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. There's a certainty there. If you go on a search for God, you will find him. Okay, God is findable. Let's read verse 35. To you it was shown. Why? Why? that you might know the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides them. God wants to be found by us. In fact, he's provided us evidence to try to find him. His presence is all around us, and he desires to be found. Um, He's not as perhaps the Epicureans would have thought in that marketplace, or maybe you're familiar with deism. He's not a clockmaker that set the world in order and then is distant and apart from it. God actively wants to be found for you. He has active will in the world today for us to find him. But he's also boundless. Let's turn over to 1 Kings. This passage of scripture, if you're familiar with it, Solomon has built the temple that his father was not able to build because he was a man of war. But in talking about the temple, he acknowledges something very important. So Solomon, at the prayer of dedication here in 1 Kings, is talking about God. And he says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. We already understand that. God cannot be contained. We talked about that when he wasn't creating the heavens and the earth because he needed somewhere to live. It's not that he can be contained in one place, but he's also not contained in one time. Let's turn over to 1 Peter 3. Excuse me, I had the wrong one there. Let's, let's go in on Psalms 2. That'll express our same sentiment. Let's go to Psalm 90. passage in 2 Peter 3 that you're probably familiar with there. The day is like a thousand years in a day aren't much different for God. Psalm 90, let's read the first two verses there. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountain was brought forth, or you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We talked about how God created the pre-appointed times, and Paul talked about that back in Acts 17. But God exists apart from time. Time is a useful metric, um, but time won't be something we're concerned about in eternity with him. But all the sermon thus far, and I've hinted at this, is talking about how awesome God is. And that's important for us to relay and to look for opportunities in life, whether that's we're looking out at nature or we're talking about Um, how much love we have for the brethren and his wisdom in making the church. But talking about how how awesome the Lord we serve is and using that awesomeness to inspire um, others to seek after him. But because God is so awesome, we, we ought not to compare things that don't need to be compared. With God. And that's where we pick up in verse 29 of Acts 17. 
Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, this time of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So Paul's message doesn't end on how great God is. It ends on a call to action. And that's because this time of ignorance is now no longer going to be overlooked. Okay, The problem of idolatry. And this is something he was stirred in his spirit about when he first comes to Athens. But you have all these people comparing the unknown God, the God of heaven, to all these different things. Whether it's the God of riches, the God of gold and silver, the God of harvest... It's inappropriate to do so. And to do so is indeed idolatry. And we can do the same thing. If we're thinking about how to structure our lives where God is of equal importance as our job or our family. In Matthew 6, 24, the passage I have up there, we can't serve two masters. God is it or God is not it. God is supposed to be our sole focus. And his awesomeness the first thing we talks about, you know, his all-powerfulness, his omnipresence, those things demand it. God's given everything for us. And in so doing, we ought to give him ourselves. So the pro- this problem of idolatry leads us to a call to repentance. These times that God had overlooked, especially for these Gentiles, he now calls them to repent. He uses the same terminology that Jesus does at the beginning of his ministry. Let's turn to that passage in Mark chapter 1. Similar sentiments there in Matthew chapter 4 if you'd like to look at it, but for sake of time, we'll read this one. So if we can up in verse 14, Now John was put in prison. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The call of the gospel has to call for a change, because to become what God would have us to be, we're not going to be able to be focused on things of the world. But to the judgment of God, there's been a righteous judge that's been appointed. Back in Acts 17... In verse 31, it says, Because he's appointed a day on which he will judge a world in righteousness by the man he's ordained. The righteous judge is going to be Jesus. And he came, as it says in Matthew 3, to fulfill all righteousness, right? At his baptism. That's what it was for, to fulfill the righteousness of God. And so will be done in judgment. But Paul wouldn't let a sermon go to waste without talking about the great hope we have in the resurrection. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 15, one of the great chapters on the import of the resurrection of Christ, and draw some implications from there. But now Christ is risen from the dead, verse 20, and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Christ has life after death, And in so doing is a guarantee that those of us here on earth will be resurrected after we're dead. There will be life after death. As Christians, we're assured of a hope for a resurrection to life. And what a blessing that is. What a blessing that hope is. But there will be a resurrection for those who do not follow after God or Christ. And we're assured of that resurrection as well. At that resurrection, after death, there comes a judgment. We almost got there in Bible class this morning, but let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 27, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this comes the judgment. So a judgment is coming, and it's confirmed by the resurrection of Jesus. All this is confirmed through that glorious miracle that 
that brought our, our faith into reality. So Paul's preached this wonderful sermon, talking about how awesome God is and what those implications are. If God is so awesome, if so, if so worthy of praise, so um, high above all things, idolatry is something we must repent of. We can't have things to be equal in our life to God because a judgment is coming in which a just God who is righteous, who's given us all these things by nature, it implies that if we don't do that, there's some consequence to it. So considerations for evangelism then. What do we talk about? Well, we identify doors. Um, doors are opportunities. Um, Paul in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3 talks about praying for doors of opportunity to be open. We've got to be on the lookout. Um, that's the first step to evangelism, and I'm stepping on my, my own toes here. But we've got to be on the lookout for opportunities to talk about God to people. If you were going to take away one thing, that would be the thing I wanted you to take away from this morning, is how Paul talks about the God of heaven and how he relays that to his audience. But two, sometimes it's not identifying doors, it's being willing to make doors. And really, sometimes it's being willing to be weird and awkward and strange to the people of this world. Um, and that's uncomfortable. By nature, it's uncomfortable to bring up God at times when it's not the right time to talk about God. It's interesting how pe people of the world or people who may not be interested in spiritual things, um, there's a lot of times in which it's not appropriate to talk about God to them. But if we're going to get in some trouble for something, wherever we are, if that's at work, if we're in the store, we're, we may be awkward to them. But is awkward in itself enough negative to outweigh talking about the God who's done everything for us? So maybe being willing to be more uncomfortable is something I could take to heart about talking about God, but talking about him specifically, talking about him in specific ways. Do you know the God who did this? Do you know the God who loves you this much? Do you know the God who made the world this way? Talking about what God has done for us specifically in our lives, and that gives us opportunities to continue the conversation about God. Have you heard about how God set the boundaries for people and set the pre-appointed times? Have you heard about God who gave his son in this way and what life he lived? But also being open to talking about judgment. Um, and Paul does this very capably. If saying, you know, maybe our introduction is how great God is, well, what happens if we don't serve this God or give him the praise that we should? Um, there's a judgment implied here. But we do need to explain why that judgment exists. Again, it all comes back to how great God is and how worthy he is of service. It's interesting, especially if you're familiar with uh, the Pauline epistles. You would think in Paul's discussion of judgment here, or I would have if I was presenting this, we'd talk about sin. You know, especially if you think about the first three chapters of Romans. It's strange to me, just looking back at it now, it's like, well, where is the, the talk about sin here? But naturally, how great God is in the presence of idolatry implies that we need to repent. If we're putting something on the same footing as God, people will understand that's not appropriate if they understand who God is. And then two, of course, we need to talk about the resurrection. And the great guarantee that is, one, that there is life after death, but then two, that there is hope for those who are in service to God and His Son. Hopefully there's been something in here that you can take away um, and mention to others, being willing to be uncomfortable for the sake of the Lord and being willing to talk about God and what he's done for us and who he is. And maybe that can be an encouragement to you as you go out and live your life throughout the day. Hopefully um, we can look for more doors and maybe be willing to make some doors in service of our Lord and King. But before we get too far, let's finish the passage. Now, verse 32, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed, among some, Diagnosis the Arapagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. In your message, you're not going to reach everybody. Everybody you talk to is not going to hear you out. They're not going to all follow you. 
But Paul became all things to all people that he by all means may save some. And if you see in this passage here, that's exactly what happened. Verse 34, however, some men joined him and believed. But expect some backlash if you're talking about God. We see some people thought about it and some mocked him. Some people's opinions he didn't change. They thought he was a babbler before and they mocked him afterward. That's something we're going to have to deal with if we're willing to talk about God. But I'll tell you, it's all worth it because of the God we serve. If you're not familiar with the God that we serve this morning, if you haven't become familiar with him or haven't made a relationship with him because you haven't heard his word, if you haven't turned away from your past life and being willing to be buried with his son in baptism, we'd ask that you do that this morning. But if you're a believer here, and maybe you've made some changes in your life that aren't for the better, maybe you've started playing, placing things on the same footing as God in your life, or you started to elevate things above God in your life and you need our prayers, we ask that whichever your need is, you may come as we stand and sing.